Hi. Uh, I'm Eric Kaplan. I'm a philosopher and a writer in Southern California. And Tao, I'm, why don't you say who you are? I'm Tao Ruspoli, and I'm also an aspiring philosopher, and I'm coming to you from Bombay Beach, California. Uh, and you are listening to Terrifying Questions or How Not and Terrifying Questions and How Not to Be Terrified by Them, a philosophy and comedy podcast where we look at frightening questions and deep questions, unsettling questions, and we try to get through to a place of uh, greater courage and uh, joy. Um, so welcome. Thank you, and welcome to all of our listeners. I'm the the temporary co-host with great honor, and uh, we we keep doing unusual uh, settings of our podcast. We we did one from a meeting of the American Society of Existential Phenomenologists. We did a kind of documentary style one last week with uh, my friend J Jeff Dyer and your new friend, and mm -hmm. now we're coming to you live from the Windmill House in uh bombay beach california where we're preparing the next bombay beach biennale which is in its eighth iteration Very and nice. um I, i'm excited to have you come back for the second time to the biennale me too me too and, um so, so why uh, don't you tell us our terrifying question for today okay our terrifying question is can you learn anything important from another person now i when you propose this it seemed such an obvious yes. Uh -huh. I said yes, just uh, uh, primarily because I wanted to hear the counter arguments because I, okay. I have trouble understanding even what it would mean to live in a world where we can't understand, we can't, where we can't learn from other people. I don't, I'm not sure how else we learn things. I suppose there's like direct experiences, but even those often involve other people. So could you make the case for why we might it might not be the case. I guess my, I, I'm sort of thinking at it from the point of view of like, if somebody came to me and said, should I live a life of love and risk or should I live a life of playing it safe? I would think the answer would have to be, don't ask me, figure it out for yourself. Um, so maybe I'm high, I, I, I will confess, I'm making a high standard of what counts as important, because obviously, if somebody wants to ask me, I don't know, uh, do I think it's a good idea to, to live in Brooklyn, I can say, well, here's the plus and minuses of living in Brooklyn, and that could easily be helpful. And, you know, they wouldn't even need me, they could just uh, Google it, right? Uh, or ask chat GPT or something. But when it comes to actual questions about how to live your life, I'm at least skeptical about the idea that anybody can teach anybody about these things. And I sort of feel like really tempted by the answer, figure it out yourself. Don't ask somebody else. Well, I mean, first of all, we're all living lives that would be impossible if we hadn't learned as a culture and as a civilization from each other, right? I mean, we're all, every everything that I can see in this moment comes from uh, things that not only I've learned from other people, but each uh, generation and each person has depended on knowledge based on generations before in order to uh, develop all the technology. Right. That's not what I'm interested in. I'm not interested in how do you make a crystal radio? Obviously, we can learn that and we should. Although interestingly, we don't need to learn that from a person. We could learn that from a database. Um, what I'm worried about or, or proposing that we talk about is, can you learn anything in the like, how to live your life department from another person? Right. Or do you need to enroll and get a diploma from the School of Hard Knocks instead? I mean, I guess we have to also make some distinctions as it always sure. Sure. between like explicit knowledge and embodied knowledge i would for lack of a better word um because obviously we learn and i'm thinking of like the way i learn from my partner um a different way to live that i would not imagine knowing about if it weren't for this existence that we share together for example so what'd you learn 
I mean, it's it's an it's again, it's hard to make explicit because I think there's like a, there's deep knowledge that we don't that is hard to, to put into words or you put into words, you're already losing something about it, but we can try. I mean, yeah, I would, give it a shot. Um, I, I think it would be like uh, learning ways to arrange the day and uh, approach the, 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 the combination of work and creativity and um, intimacy and uh you know the the way you arrange your life with another person you don't arrange your life you're you've been married many years you have children mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i don't think you your life is, is is arranged in a very substantive substantive ways according to this relationship that you share with somebody would you not say right i guess um does that count as learning well that's the question right because um like uh like like let's say we're doing something together right we're we're carrying like that story in aesop of the father and the son who are carrying a donkey um then the partnership has to in a sense learn through experience how to carry that donkey and i'm using the donkey as a metaphor for the burdens of life um like you need to as a partnership figure some stuff out but then I would I would sort of revert to my idea that the the partnership of Tao and Dulcine has to learn on its own and cannot learn from some other partnership. Like you cannot go to like Eric and Raduka and say, "How do we do it?" And we'll say, "You got to do this." Like I don't think that works. So so I'm I'm digging in. <laughs> I'm protecting my position, but I'm digging in. But now saying that amongst the things that can learn things are collectives, not just people. Good. I like that. So then I thought that, but I'm so, glad you're pushing me because I think this is interesting. I do too. So I, I thought I was thinking before the, before the podcast that there would be three examples of how mm -hmm. we learn from each other. That one would be, um, from our parents as we're growing up. Uh, -huh, that's interesting. That also yeah. includes uh, learning how not to do things probably. Sure often and then there's um but we we look to these people who are you know uh probably we look up to them hopefully for 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 many years and and then we have teachers which even it's in the name teaching right and and i've i've had great relationships that that have shaped me and i want to go deeper into that because we shared uh, uh uh the same teacher mm -hmm. uh, it was a, a big influence on both of our lives so i think um, you have teachers and professors, um, and then and then we have partners. So I thought, and then I'm sure you learn from your children too. But I don't have children yet, so I, I can't speak to that. But I can imagine that 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 would be the fourth big important type. Are of you thinking you might? Is it something you'd like to do? Um, I think uh, I'm not close to the idea, nor uh -huh. am I seeking it in the immediate future. So right, right. It's, it's I'm agnostic, mm -hmm. but that's a whole other episode. <laughs> Oh, so, so, terrifying so, question. Should Tao have children? <laughs> <laughs> it is terrifying <laughs> for other people, for the children, probably the most. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> so, so, so let's start at the beginning. We're small children and we, we need to make our way in the world. Obviously we learn some things, as you say, by figuring it out, but it's a very inefficient way to, to learn things. Or at least if it was, if it was by itself, if you had kids like just alone in the world, trying to figure things out, I imagine uh, humanity, not only the, the child's life, but humanity as a whole would not move forward very well. If, um, if they weren't, if we weren't learning from, from our peers. So, yeah, so let's, let's take the example of, um, language learning yeah now that's that's, that's interesting because obviously we need other people around to learn a language and we need to learn a language but they're not teaching it to us they're just letting us soak it up so i'm wondering maybe my um maybe my question should be um sharpened up a little bit because that's obviously true obviously we learn a language and that's important and no one could learn it on their own so sure um but i wonder whether the language alone according what to 
I was like, they, you can't, there couldn't even be a private language. No, there couldn't be language if people did not share it. Um, but I wonder whether what I'm trying to say should be, um, it's, I, well, well, here, here's a, here's a weak claim. And I, and I feel like I might be able to advance something stronger than this weak claim, but I'll advance this, which is that nothing very important is ever learned by someone teaching it to somebody else. Um, because I don't think language, we teach it to somebody else. I think we just sort of put the person in a situation where they can absorb it. Um, but maybe that's, maybe can, that's can you, fine. Can you clarify because... that distinction? Can you, can you go deeper into what the difference is between a teaching something and, 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 and absorbing it when someone else does it? What is well, the... well, okay. Let's think of a couple differences. One is you need not know anything about English or the rules of English. Uh, or how English differs from any other language. And you need not wish to teach English. And if you speak English around a child of the right age, they'll learn it. <laughs> so, so, it, and maybe you want to say that, you know, we're talking about, you know, gurus um, and, you know, the way in which um, a parent might teach you how to be a man or how to be... Uh, a, a husband or, you know, how to get dressed. And maybe there's all that stuff that happens based upon our primary role models. And then um, if we run into um, other people in this world who we admire, we can model our behavior on them too. And, and I do think that happens. Um, but I guess I, I'm sympathetic to the idea that um, the real name of the game is your decision to pick these people rather than their decision to show anything to you. Maybe, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I should just abandon this whole idea. Um, but you know what I mean? Yeah, I, mean, I like the idea of, 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 of winning the terrifying questions debate. Yeah. Again. Yeah, and then you could advance to the round, and and then you I don't can, think you should give up so easily. I shouldn't, because I was thinking you could then go on, like I could leave, and then you could fight someone else next week, um, possibly Robert Pippen, <laughs> who was here at the Bombay Beach. I game. know, I know. I'm sorry I missed him, but that 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 year I needed to put in the begonias. <laughs> but um, so I want I want to get into specifics, um, because I have a great gratitude for a specific teacher mm -hmm. who I think taught me not only philosophy and made me uh, decide to study philosophy. I was going to be an architect. Mm -hmm. and, and at Berkeley, it was so fun that you got to choose. Yeah. Unlike high school, you get to choose the courses you take. And mm -hmm. I always loved philosophy. So I read philosophy books on my own time, but I didn't think you could actually be a philosopher unless you're going to be a professor. So, and I know I didn't want to be a professor. Mm -hmm. So, I, I didn't even consider philosophy as a pursuit. And then, but I, I realized you could take, you could take a class just for fun. Mm -hmm. And I see in the course book, I'm a freshman at UC Berkeley, and there's a, a class called Existentialism in Literature and Film. And I was like, ooh, that looks great. So I signed up for it and I show up in this, in this room and it's the, one of the most popular courses at Berkeley worldwide, because it was one of the first, uh, courses that was a uh, podcast out in the nineties already. Uh, Bert Dreyfus, the professor was, was, uh, he was profiled on, on the news because truck drivers were listening to his lectures from Berkeley. And this was very new at the time. And he was by all accounts, a great teacher mm -hmm. and saw his art form and his craft as more teaching than it was philosophy even. And his favorite philosopher that he thought most about was Heidegger. And Heidegger said that if you want to teach, you have to teach by example. And the example the teacher has to give is one who learns. Uh huh. I remember that because the first paper in grad school I wrote for Bert was about philosophy of education. That's what I thought my field was going to be. 
Mm -hmm. And we found this thing uh, where he says a teacher is because Heidegger always likes to switch around the concept of activity is that a teacher is someone who lets learn. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Because I want to I want to try to get into that into the idea, because maybe we can find a bridge between my position and yours and the idea of like learning being like opening yourself to the to the world and being receptive to it in some way. And then the teacher uh, is someone who helps open up, open you up to by learn. being open himself, by modeling exactly. being open. Exactly. Spoiler mm -hmm. alert. <laughs> uh, so, so, so I, you know, I witnessed this this great teacher doing his thing, which was one of the most surprising aspects of his teaching was that, and I, I then found this across the board in masters of different fields, not only teaching but also whether it's filmmaking or carpentry or music, there is um, a, a constant recognition that there's more to be learned. Mm -hmm. I thought when, when I saw people who hit a ceiling before hitting the ultimate mastery, and so far as that might even exist, mm -hmm. people who did very well in their careers, but didn't go all the way. I noticed they always were the ones who thought they knew everything. And the people who I most admired who had, you know, who seemed to be great learners and therefore great teachers also. And this is also when I, when I like had apprenticeships with filmmakers later on, there was this constant uh, willingness to admit that you could still had a lot to learn and mm -hmm. you're going to stop learning. So Bert uh, Dreyfus would do this in front of the class. Every time someone asked a question, you would think after 25 years of teaching the same course, you would easily say, of course, I know the answer that you're just a little lowly freshman uh, kid. Um, I, I don't learn, I teach you. And so, but there was never that attitude. There was always the sense like, oh my God, that's a really interesting question. Let me think about it. Let me. Uh, yeah. And that was so inspiring to watch. And, and it was like philosophy happening before your eyes. You're watching this great philosopher learn in front of you. And then it put you, it like in this disposition disposedness towards learning and this kind of openness. And I think that in addition to all the content of what I might've learned in philosophy from this great teacher, it was this kind of openness to learning constantly that I think counts as one of your something important to learn from someone. Sure. So now, now I'm curious about something, which is um, like, there's two different kinds of people who don't know anything. <laughs> There's the kind of person like Bert who didn't know anything, but he also kind of did know a lot. And then there's a kind of person who literally doesn't know anything. And, and like, let's say like there's somebody, I, I mean, this actually exists. There's somebody who's actually a professor in the music department. And now they've been forced to teach an intro to philosophy. And you come in and you say, why are we studying philosophy? And they say, I don't know. And then they say, you say, well, who are the great philosophers? And they say, I don't know. Um, like, that's a bad kind of not knowing. But then Bird had a good kind of not knowing. What's the difference? Yeah, I think obviously there is a huge chasm of difference there. Sure. <laughs> and, one, would, uh, one would hope. <laughs> so I think... That, so, so someone who's been learning and been open to the world for, for decades, and he had a whole skill model. So it's a really, we're, we're on, operating on many levels here. Because, yeah, we are, at uh, least. There's, so, so he was very interested in how we learn and master skills. And then I, he was. I, I, I picked up this interest and made a film about it, um, which was exploring how skillful mastery it leads to also a more meaningful existence. So we're, the stakes are high too. Because yeah, they are. The idea is that if you if if we if we do if we don't know anything and we don't master skills, life could be much emptier than it is. Mm -hmm. when we develop deep skills, right? So then the question is, how do we learn these skills? But, and we could even uh, bring in the same question because there's a sense in which the master does not know any rules, and there's a sense in which the Zen mind is the beginner's mind. But then there's and then I'll just pose the same question, which is, what's the difference between how the master doesn't know any rules and how the ignoramus doesn't know any rules? Why isn't every beginner's mind a Zen mind? Yeah, if every Zen mind is a beginner's mind. If Bert was right, the skill model uh, was, and this also had 
uh, um, impl huge implications in the field of artificial intelligence, which mm -hmm. is very on everyone's mind. Yeah. Um, so the, the the question was uh, used to maybe the the traditional philosophical tr um, thought around this would be that the, we have to think about rules and you have to impart rules and then the the the, the master is the person who knows the rules the best. Yes. Instead, Bert didn't say that that wasn't necessary. He just said that, that you're, you're missing some steps after that. And I think right. that's the big difference, right? Like, yes, at the beginning, if you're learning to, let's say his favorite example was uh, uh, driving a stick shift. Um, when, you, when you first get in the car, if you're going to make the car go, you're going to need to follow certain rules. You're going to like know that the first gear is in the top left. And then you're going to know that after maybe it reaches certain RPMs, you're going to want to shift gears. And the problem with the rules is that they're they, they're based on generalities, and generalities only go so far because the the, the the specific situation often varies from those generalities. And so the master starts to become tuned in to the particularities of the unique situation, and then the rules have to give way. And sure. then the tradition might say that that's that the, the rules have just become unconscious. But then Bert said, well, that's like saying I learned to ride a bicycle with uh, with uh, the tricycle with what do you, how do you call them the training wheels. But um, now I don't need the training wheels anymore. So therefore, the training wheels must have become invisible. Right? Yes. So, so, Go ahead. so, so here's the thing, or here's a thing, which is um, the master of driving the car. We all kind of know what that looks like even if we are not good at driving the car um because it well you you get there without crashing it <laughs> you know um you, you uh if in terms of the stick you know it's smooth rather than jerky stuff like that is like the clutch doesn't give out or what have you um but when it comes to how to live your life um and this is a bird example like you could have people leave leaving leading radically different lives you could have someone who is devoting himself to outrageous works of art and someone else who is um disappearing into every uh every social situation in order to help people and make it easier for them like you know the artist and the saint and they're both on bert's model masters of being human um but it strikes me as weird that um, I don't know why it strikes me as weird. I guess it strikes me as weird. Like, or like one thing I want to say is which one you choose to follow is not something you can learn from either of them. So that makes me wonder who you could learn it from and how you could learn it. So I sort of feel like you have to either learn it from yourself or, or from uh, the mysterious universe itself. I, I don't know. But I don't feel like how another human could teach you that. But what or could another the, human teach you that? One of the one of the uh, prerequisites of becoming a master is a, a commitment to that mm -hmm. thing that you're trying to master, right? Because if you are constantly improvising, and today I want to be a carpenter, and tomorrow I want to be a philosopher, and the next day I want to be a musician, you might never reach that master. Could you become a master dilettante? That's Can you be a master at, at being a jack of all trades, do you think? Maybe. I, I, I don't. Yeah, maybe. But I, I think where I was going with this is that uh -huh. I think that uh, you can learn by example, by seeing what it's taken other masters to uh, get to where they are. So if you want to be a great philosopher, you might look at the trajectory of Bert's career. If you want to be a great, you know, jazz pianist, you might look at the great jazz pianists who have come before you and you'll learn from them that you know being great isn't just going on stage and being great but it involves all sorts of steps along the way which involve commitment involve risk involve practice involve all of the things that that are are on this uh skill model but right. i think we need examples that we look up to and this is we go back to the kind of embodied knowledge that doesn't isn't necessarily explicit because you might have you might just see somebody who you aspire to be like, and it's not in what they say, but it's in what they are and, 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 uh, and how they embody their, their mastery. And then, you right. Know. But what, what is it that 
allows the ignoramus or the adolescent to pick a master? Is it just superficial glitter and 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 social prestige that you're just like i'm seeing that guy stepping up on a stage playing a guitar and everybody's looking at him i want everybody to look at me like that's not a good model right no and then i i, I don't know how much agency you want to ascribe to it too because the, the, a lot of people who are really great at things they say that it picked them as much uh -huh, as interesting it, right so that i think that you come back so to, maybe the like, person is not the teacher maybe the skill is the is the teacher yeah, the the world in Heidegger's uh, language, you have domains or you have worlds, not as in the earth, but you have the world of jazz, you have the world of, of philosophy. So and the world of philosophy just you. picked you and used Bert as like a tool for shaping you. Is that is that the picture? I think we want to try and I think it's probably a bit of both. And we probably mm. the distinction between the world and the people in it is not as clear cut as we'd like as we might make it. I think the world is made of the people in it mm -hmm. and the traditions and the skills that have developed in that time. So like our friend Mark Rathel says in, in, in Being in the World, he says, it's not like the world of jazz was somewhere in the Middle Ages, like waiting for someone to discover it. No, I don't think so. Or was it invented from scratch, but somehow it emerged out of a, of a rich tradition and a spe specificity of a place and time where those traditions came in. And then what you couldn't have predicted, you know, in, and in, in, in thinking about it in today's terms, like if you fed, someone did a thought experiment saying, if you fed all of music up until the year 1900 into a large language model, you might be able to say, okay, let's blend, you know, uh, Mozart and African, you know, tribal music, and it, it might be able to do some sort of Frankenstein thing like that. But the jazz would never emerge from that. It's not like in there. It's like it emerges from it. There's like a, a kind of clearing in this language again, like that 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 a world can kind of whoosh up. And I, it's made up of the people in it, and it's made up of the of the of the tradition and of those kind of practices of a, of a right culture. right so on this picture i think we may have wandered away from at least my question which is whether we need to learn from other people because it sounds on this tradition on this view that the world is whooshing into existence and if you're lucky enough to be sucked up into that you'll do something interesting with your life and if you're not you won't so but I want to say like... the people in it are really important. So I don't think the world of the world of the blues is more than just the individuals who played, but each of those great blues players contributed in really meaningful ways. And I think that if you got to be, if you were lucky enough to be around one of these greats, you would learn something important from these people that, and your life would be markedly different than it would be if you hadn't met. Well, these sure, sure, sure. So. I guess maybe here's a way of asking this question, which is, um, I'm not going to ask this yet. I'm going to ask something else. What I'm going to ask is, um, does the following model seem right? That Bert Dreyfus has been kicked around by philosophy and he's, He's gotten in his bones what seems like an interesting question that's going to give him some juice and it's going to help him. And also what seems like a boring question and what seems like a worthwhile problem that's worth putting time into and what kind of problem seems like a waste of time. And he's got the kind of um, virtue, courage to deal with that. And that's so cool that you just want to be around it. And then when you're around these kind of courageous people who have been kicked around by the, by the quest, then you can kind of get some courage and, and some skill for your own quest. How does that strike you? I mean, that, that seems like a, a way to tell the story that, that mm -hmm. works. Um, I think it might be useful to also give a little 
kind of historical context on why because obviously there's the, there's the 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 side of the story which is that he had an influence on us as a teacher yeah but he did. then there's there's the historical context that he was interested in and and which is very relevant today which is not only how people learn things but is it possible for a computer to learn something and where is our human being different from the way that a computer is right well, I'll say one thing about your example about putting all of music at the age at the year 1900 into a computer is I don't even know what that means. What would it like, like, like the because music includes how people move their bodies all over the world. How would you precisely put the way people move their bodies all over the world into a computer? What does it even mean? It seems well, that, like a poorly, uh, like a kind of a a poorly imagined example and i'm not i'm not claiming blaming you for it i think the people who are pushing this model are are a little naive about what it would mean to put something into <laughs> into a computer oh yeah yeah you know? yeah you're, you're getting you're you're you're, you're predicting where i was going to go with this um i wanted to make a couple extra steps yeah. um so so because the the traditional philosophical story about what makes human beings special and different from animals and objects in the world for thousands of years people thought or philosophers thought um that what made us special is that we were uh thinking things right that mm -hmm. we had reason and we could like uh, we could take up uh, we would learn things by having rules that could be made explicit and that the, the 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 thing that was most special about being human was that we could think rationally about the world right mm -hmm. and in this model, a body is not so important, right? It's just no. like the body is kind of actually the opposite of important. It gets in the way. Uh, we're actually just thinking things that are happen to have to lug around these imperfect things. But in the world of thought, it, everything's much more beautiful and perfect and ideal. And you know, Plato was the big uh, proponent of this, but his his influence lasted for thousands of years after his death, right? Mm -hmm. And and so what. Bert's genius was in the 1950s. He was at MIT, which is, uh, you know, very technologically inclined school. The philosophy department probably was not so important, but he was there teaching philosophy at uh, a school that was more famous for math and engineering, and a lot of this kind of uh, emphasis on rationality and on disembodied thought was uh, where it was at. And mm -hmm. and at the time, the computer was a new invention. This is in the 1950s. And of course, human beings tend to say, always think that they are essentially whatever the latest clever invention that they've come up with is. So as soon as they came up with the computer, they thought, oh, well, human beings must be computers too. Yes. Um, so not only have we figured out what you philosophers have not been able to figure out for thousands of years, what makes uh, human beings special, but we've, we've now reduced it to a machine and we're going to be able to uh, create an artificial a human within a few years. This was like the claim that a lot of people were making in the AI world in the 1950s. And Bert, being an unassuming, you know, kind of adorable little man, uh, without being belittling, I obviously looked up to him very much, but his whole demeanor was very kind of, uh, he was like a, I think uh, John Hoagland said, like a little insect almost. Yeah. And, uh, and, but I and, would like to people to think of him as a beautiful butterfly rather than a cockroach if we're talking yeah. about insects but but uh he had this like you know wild red hair and he was kind of just rebellious and a shrimpy red-headed guy is how my dad <laughs> described him and and so here he was in the philosophy department at mit which you know was not the most uh respected department probably they didn't think the philosophers had anything important to say about the world and he was saying you know guys you're, you're basing your whole research program of artificial intelligence on an outdated view of what it is to be human if you if you read these new philosophers coming out of europe uh which was the the existential phenomenologists like heidegger, heidegger and merleau ponty most specifically yeah also foucault and mm -hmm. uh you would realize that to be human is not to just have abstract rational thoughts, but it is to be always already in the world with a body, right? And that a lot of these, and this is why I asked you earlier, like, are there things that we learn that aren't necessarily able to be made explicit? Because we learn things by being with each other and mm -hmm. by 
move with each other. And, and Dreyfus talked a lot about, for example, we have skills that we don't even realize are skills, like um, distance standing practices. Uh, you don't. You might have gone your whole life without thinking about uh, how far you should stand from someone right. to talk to them. Right. And you might not remember who taught you that because you never thought about it at all. But the moment you go to another culture where people stand closer to each other, suddenly it might become very apparent that you do have a skill and you're uncomfortable with the fact that other people have a skill that's, that looks different in this very same domain, right? Right. So that's like an example of something that you might learn. And, and, and Bert would talk about um, you know, the, how you would teach these embodied practices, even from the moment of infancy, like the way that Japanese mothers might put a baby on its back more often, and it therefore like inculcate a certain receptivity to the world. And Western mothers were more apt to put their baby's stomach down because it would, they would want the baby to crawl around and be more active. Mm -hmm. you know? So there's a, a type of learning from someone that just you might never think about. Right, right. I, I wonder whether um, uh, maybe, maybe conflict amongst teachers is good um, because um, when we see when we see our teachers in conflict, it sort of broadens the, the conceptual space of what it could be to be a human. Like, I think it's interesting that, um, like the, uh, the Talmud says an interesting thing that, um, one of the signs of a good teacher is that they're like a poisonous snake, like they're vengeful and hostile to other teachers. And it's always like kind of struck with me because I'm like, no, wouldn't the best teacher be um, like kind and gentle? But but it's almost like you're learning this ability in the individual teacher to fight for a position. And that teaches you that the positions are important, even if you yourself don't have, end up agreeing with them. I, I just think about how in the history of philosophy, like there are these sort of, it often comes down to us in these sort of dueling pairs you know, that we have Kierkegaard fighting with Hegel. We have Plato fighting with Aristotle. In the Middle Ages, we have the, the Scotus fighting with Aquinas. There's the nominalists versus the realists. And maybe, um, maybe that's good, or maybe that's a profound thing about how to receive, um, how to let learn is to is to realize that there are these warring positions and there are even these warring positions within us i don't know just because because I, I guess one of the things i'm sort of trying to like hash out in my own mind is like how can we both accept that learning is is you know very important and there are these heroic figures that we like but also that to simply find the heroic figure and turn into a copy of that heroic figure is a betrayal. It's not actually learning what one should learn. Um, I don't know what I'm saying. Tao, help me, tell me what I'm saying. Well, I think, I think this idea of conflict is good because it also harkens back to the idea of never resting on your laurels. Like the mm -hmm. idea that there's always something you're pushing up against. Mm -hmm. so that was another thing that 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 in this philosophy is that the world is something that pushes back in a way that forces you to be receptive to it. Right. Oh, so, for right. example, if you had a material that was malleable in any infinite of infinite number of ways, mm -hmm. and it was just your will exerted on that material what would emerge would be less interesting than if you were working with like wood or marble that had its own kind of, I don't want to ascribe too much agency to the material, but there's like a, a kind of power to the material. So were we, were we Bert's material? Do you think are the students his material as a teacher? Yeah, because we are the, the ones that would force him to respond to the unique situation. Right. So the way so... that you learn most effectively is response to the, not to the generality, which is where the rules live, but to the, to the unique situation. So when you ask the question to Bert, rather than like file it into the, 
the the category of like dumb student questions that all would have the same answer he would be responding to the unique question that was brought about in that unique moment and there was this kind of receptivity to the specificity of the situation and so i think i was going to ask a marker you of a great master i was going to ask you how you think people can be better teachers but but what you just said made me think of a better and more interesting question so sometimes people say that um, people end up getting the the bad government that they deserve. You know, in other words, they haven't taken responsibility over their society enough to demand a better government. So they're they're lied to by various hucksters, as we see happening in in our country today. Um, I'm wondering whether if we complain about pompous or shallow teachers, that's on us, and whether we are getting the teachers we deserve. And that makes me want to ask the question, if you meet someone, what kind of attitude will turn them into the best teacher? Like, how do you get the most juice out of the orange that every teacher is? Um, and it, it also makes me think of another, uh, I, I think uh, it was some some Buddhist teacher I met. I think it was Lung Po Tian. I, I don't really remember his name, but he was in Thailand. And he said, the person in front of me, my teacher, the person to the right of me, my teacher, the person behind me, my teacher, that the the best student is someone who's able to sort of learn from everybody. And that sounds corny if you choose to make it corny, but I think it can also be pretty deep. Um, and I want to kind of explore that with you. Like, how do you get people to teach you? Yeah, and, and you 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 studied in the East, right? Because the whole Zen tradition has a whole has a rich practice around learning. Isn't it even like the teacher should beat the the student with a stick sometimes? The mercy stick, Back yeah, body. yeah, that's true. Um, there there was this funny thing I I learned not not personally, but from a book from uh, Lungpo Mahabua, where or, no, maybe it was his teacher. His teacher was Ajahn um, Mun. Ajahn Mun said this to Mahabua, which is they don't want to answer stupid questions. They want to ignore questions that they think you could figure out on your own. So they're very selective about what questions to answer, um, which I thought was pretty cool because it was just so counterintuitive because I would have thought you want to answer all the questions and Bert certainly thought that way. Um, but I think there's another question, which is, um, what should the student do in order to get the best teaching from each person we encounter? This might be too uh, neat of a knot to tie it into, but it just occurred sure. to me, so I'm going to throw it out there. At the beginning, we we posited two seemingly con contrasting notions. On yes. one side, you have the idea that someone teaches you something. And on the other hand is you have somebody uh, figuring stuff out on their own. And maybe the the place we land is that the best teacher may, teaches you how to figure it out on your own. Yeah, I think because that's probably right. Answer, giving you the answer is not is a superficial way to learn something. So if 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 I say uh you know what did what did kierkegaard think about x y and z and the, and the professor just tells me it's not nearly as effective as if he tells me how to go and figure and and learn it from the text and how to read right. the text i mean it's a, it's a cliche almost right like, the, the, like what do you think kierkegaard thought well i don't know what do you think i think kierkegaard thought well what do you think i think you think kierkegaard thought and at some point you figure out what kierkegaard thought or you just get so tired or the you world decide, of, you, know, you decide you don't care what your card thought i know and then and then there's the idea that, that the more you learn about something the richer the world becomes our, our our friend ian thompson is good talking about this where like there's certain domains of literature of philosophy of music that the deeper you go the more you can learn from that right text right or the work and and the which ends up making you feel stupider because the more you learn, the more you realize that there's all these deep, rich questions that you don't have a clue of how to answer. So that's why the the one of the signs of the good teacher is humility, because the good teacher will think he doesn't know so many important things. But the, but the one other thing we haven't talked about that's so important yeah. is that when you as you learn, be it from 
the other humans or from the history the of the world the, or the domain, tradition. Yeah. Um, the, the, that domain becomes richer and richer and it's not just a subjective experience. So the example I like for this is um, chess. I, mm -hmm. I think it's one of Bert's examples too. So as you learn chess, when you first learn, you might just see a bunch of wooden pieces on some checkered squares yes. and, and that's all you see. Uh, you don't even know how to distinguish, distinguish between the pieces, right? No. Then you learn that that's the pawn and that's the queen and, and what each of those pieces can do. And all of a sudden, a world of possibilities opens up to you because certain possibilities are closed off and some are open and you say, well, I, can, I have this ability to push the pawn forward and be aggressive. And, yeah. and that's not a, just a subjective experience that the, the, you really are being aggressive or you really are making a mistake. Uh, you know, if you, if you make your, your queen vulnerable or, 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 or give her up by accident. So that those possibilities, and then as you get more and more skillful, the world gets even more uh, nuanced and rich. So you, a, 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 a very skillful chess player might say the queen looks impotent in that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The rook yeah. is really powerful there. Again, not a subjective, um, uh, it's partially subjective because it's, it's specific to your position in that moment. But what's happened as you've learned is that the world has become this vast domain that has opened up from this skillful behavior. Right. It also it show you can sometimes to... become more elegant and simple and austere, right? As you learn that certain things like, like here's an example, um, to the skilled chess player, what the pieces are made out of is going to be significantly less important than it is to the child who doesn't know chess. Yeah. Um, and then, and then, and then you go into the abstract where maybe it doesn't even matter anymore, the physicality of the pieces, but I would say it probably doesn't like if you're, if you're a, a top level player, you don't care very much. Like it could be all in your mind, right? It could all and be maybe that's what makes screen. chess less interesting than jazz or literature or philosophy. I, I'll tell you what I think makes chess less interesting, which is the rules tell you who won. Right. And in jazz and literature and philosophy, the rules do not tell you who won. And you have these interesting cases where some people say, um, well, who won poetry in the 1920s? Well, it was clearly T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland. But nobody around then, with a few exceptions, thought he won. They thought it was garbage, <laughs> you know. So that's so much more interesting than chess. There's, there's nobody who, like, as far as I know, he lost all the chess he was playing, but we, in retrospect, think he was a great chess player. Um, is there? Could there be? I, 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 I was watching also a, an interview with Miles Davis the other day on mm -hmm. YouTube, and they asked him, how do you pick the, the musicians you want to play with? Oh, uh, what did he say? You know, the guitarist or something. And you assume that anyone who's going to go and audition for Miles Davis is going to be at a certain level of greatness. Mm -hmm. so it's not going to be the, the person who's never, you know, like you were saying earlier, who doesn't even know how to play at all. No, but, he picks, if he picks up the, the, the horn by the wrong end, it's not, he's not even getting into that room. That's yeah. true. So, so, so based on that prerequisite, uh, Miles Davis said, I look at the way the person walks. I mm -hmm. look at the way he holds the instrument. I look at his basically his demeanor and his disposition because I can see the 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 type of musician and what he's going to bring by these cues. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was so interesting because it's like we we're talking about embodiment, right? The great chess player probably doesn't it doesn't matter how he moves the pieces, right? Like I don't think it does. Not it's not a, a rich enough world in these 64 squares. It's quite a rich world. It's amazing. It shows how world. Although his work. level of exhaustion, Thanks. you know, there is a physical element to high level chess, which people yeah. don't think about. But anyway, well, I don't think it's well taken. I don't think it's not a, a, a domain that's where mastery and skillfulness and teaching and all this stuff can occur. But it's kind of a it's a it's a liminal it's a it's a, it's a marginal a world. low level case, a low level case, a low sure. level case. And it's right. You know, I, I think that on on one side of that, you might have places where you can't have meaningful 
uh, uh, this world disclosing meaning, rich meaning. Oh, have you ever been surprised by something that you thought was a low level case, but then turned out to be more world disclosing than you gave it credit? Like what? What do you have? What do you have in mind? I felt I feel kind of like I used to look down on um, on hair cutting. Like I thought that the 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 domain of of hair arrangement was was pretty boring stuff. But now I don't think that anymore. Now I think it could be pretty. It, you could disclose a world by your interaction with people's hair and how they present themselves with their hair and what kind of person they're going to the be. The world of the barbershop and how people like show up there and it focuses people's yeah. practices. Yeah. I have in mind more when I think of an impoverished world where nothing can happen is more like video games, uh, simple board games like, you know, tic-tac-toe. I don't think you're going to disclose a world. I don't think you could disclose a world through flipping coins. I think that's true because they can only come up really two ways. <laughs> Right. basically and then, then that's the problem with these computer worlds right it's like too um rule defined and 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 limited in this in this inexhaustibility that exists in these other wor worlds so when you go into the hair cutting world it also spills out into there's there's probably the culture of the of of the hair you know the school that they might yeah how you do. talk to the person when you're cutting their hair yeah. exactly and then there's the, the kind of it's it's a rich domain that doesn't it's it's not easily defined right it'd be it pretty interesting like if people started to come to me and they said we met this really cool guy and i'm like what's so cool about him he's got this new method of flipping coins and and we're just going to go off and just spend years hanging around this guy flipping coins i think that'd be such an interesting conversation to have because i wouldn't want to say you're wrong but I would want to say you're wrong, but maybe I'm the one who's wrong. Maybe he is flipping coins in some way that has never occurred to me before. And there's also there's like these these there's domains where we just take it for granted that we're pretty good at that we're That's true. like walking. That's true. Right. So like yeah. like why don't why aren't we all in this amazing state of world disclosure when we're doing this thing so masterfully, which is just walking around? What is it that's so much more? Um, exhilarating about watching a great musician than a great walker hmm. i i think maybe we that. should just lower our standards for what exhilarates us and then we'll be exhilarated more yeah and then because the, the, the idea was that when you were in when you reach this high level of mastery you get into a state of flow where the difference between you and the world kind of disappears you get out of this being in your head right and the, the aim of it was that the great most the skillful person is like in a state of flow and we we should we should we should uh look for that now, i don't know if we right. veer off too far into world disclosure and skillfulness instead of learning but i think they're in into intricately and intimately i do think so i do together think so. well i'm feeling kind of complete right now is there anything we should um is there any is there any like uh stuff that's lying around the workshop that we should gather up and at least put in its place or is there anything that that you are interested in that you want to talk about before we we sign off well i since we started talking about bert i would just like to uh, i think people should look him up and 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 take some of the courses that are still around he he died a few years ago but mm -hmm. um if you're interested in this like uh you know, skill model of how we learn and, and thinking about, you know, how it might apply to today's uh, issues around artificial intelligence and being human versus being, you know, being in a, the human world versus the computer world. Um, look up the uh, uh, Bert Dreyfus's philosophy lectures. Also, I'll make a shameless plug for my film being in the world, which like explores uh, how skillful mastery is important to mm -hmm. Uh, a meaningful existence and how technology threatens that. Because what we haven't gotten into at all is how um, technology takes away the need to learn skills. So for example, if you compare uh, learning a musical instrument in the old days, uh, if you wanted to hear music, you'd have to pick up an instrument and, and do the work to learn from the instrument, from your teacher, from yourself and your own, you know, the way you can get your personality through the instrument. And then you would uh, meet other people who played complementary instruments. Mm -hmm. So if I, uh, you know, if I play the, the, 
the violin and you play the cello and we have two other friends and we could form a quartet and then we would meet at a specific place in a specific at a, at a particular time and suddenly yeah. that place and that time would acquire significance because they were different from the times that we couldn't get together to play music and yeah, we were true room because it had great uh, acoustics and we would become receptive. right right somebody was telling me that um different kinds of heavy metal and punk developed in different uh parts of america differently because of the acoustics and the way you would need to play heavy metal out in the desert where you are is different than the way you'd play it in brooklyn where there's tall buildings everywhere Absolutely. And, 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 and so those places and times and people would be individuated and therefore become meaningful. And if you compare that to the phone where you can just put on, it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter what time it is. Uh, you can listen to anything. Um, and you don't have to learn anything from anyone. You, what, what happens The the music becomes interchangeable. So you're yeah. like, it's, I could listen to this, I could listen to it, and, and, and you don't know what you're looking for anymore because it's not, the music isn't fitting the environment also because it's it's going into your ears instead of into a shared space. Right, so, right, right. But when you take away the the, the need for, the, for learning meaningful, skillful behavior, you end up in a world where all meaningful differences are flattened. So right. and I, not and only I do should think we learn from each other, but we need to like cultivate practices in which we learn from each other and, 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 and develop these worlds. That's and the one of the problem. things we're, we also do, I think, is uh, is we become emotionally integrated, because if you think about it, if you know that some people are playing jazz in some club in your neighborhood, you have to deal with the fear that they won't like you and the desire that they will like you and the shame and the pride and the love and i think if when you feel those feelings uh, on sort of not dampered like fully you you learn a lot and, and you become more than if you imagine you're just sort of getting some facts um and, and i'll put in a plug for um the sort of uh love hate relationship you can have with individual books um, which I think you don't get from a Google search. And that includes this book. There's something wicked about this book, but I'm really attracted to it. Or this book is boring, but I really need to learn it. Or this book seems enjoyable, but the more I spend time reading it, the more I feel it's a waste of time that I think uh, like you can relate, or at least in the old days, in the old days when people read books, instead of just searching on, on the computer, um, you, you would have a relationship almost like to people. Like they were like, um, I guess they were a little bit like um, the fetishized skulls of the ancestors, that if you cradled them to your naked flesh, they would whisper to you. Um, and that's what a book is. And I think a Google search is different. Now, maybe maybe there'll be new um, ways to have insane, equally insane relationships to Google searches as I had to books, but but I'm looking forward to it. One thing we keep like hinting at, but we haven't said explicitly no. is community. Community. Uh, I thought I, you were going to say learned, eroticism. I thought uh, you were going to say the way that you're sort of in love with the teacher. No, I was thinking just in terms of how these practices gather community and we learn. Mm -hmm. in community. And yeah. I think that the, the, the technological age, uh, uh, it, it it's and they become elective the families. It becomes, it becomes it becomes isolating. And do, so, do you think to your teachers are sort of an elective family, like your co? Like I feel like you, me, Mark, Ian, we're like brothers, mm -hmm. and Bird is like a chosen um, father, awesome. you know, and that and that makes it kind of juicy in a way that I like. Yeah, and I think I think you have to be humble, and you have to like it, it's it's. I think that the 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 thought that keeps coming back to me is that we need to be receptive in order to be able to be taught. It, yeah. there's, there's a way of closing yourself off to the world, and there's a way to open yourself up to others, and that's where the 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 the, the space opens up for yeah. us. To each other and that's a beautiful thing and but you can allow it to happen it's possible to be in a world where we don't learn from each other and that's a, a impoverished existence compared to one where you admit you don't know yeah. admit someone might know something important 
and and hopefully then and exist that you have needs admit that you have needs that yeah. you come out into this world with needs that were not met by your family of origin and in a state of sort of confusion and and uh you know in a tizzy as it were and then you're out there trying to find someone who can resolve that tizzy all right well thank you eric i hope that i learned i learned from you every time we have these conversations and i, I learned from you yeah so i hope and, that our and, and if the people at too. home are in an impoverished world leave that impoverished world and find a better world i mean unless you're stuck but you know if you if you have the wherewithal to leave your impoverished world then you should do it and 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 come visit bombay beach yeah come visit bombay beach of course okay <laughs> okay beautiful you. this was a good one thanks Tao. have awesome. a good evening bye bye